Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Sorry, we're, we're going through some technical difficulties. Oh, OK, great. We have David in here. I made it. Made it. And it looks like Sarah's in here, too. Yeah. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, I feel like the teacher is walking into the classroom like and everyone's just. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it looks like we are good to go. Um, let's maybe wait another 30 seconds or so for people to, to come in and then we can get started. Well, we're, we're happy to have you. Yes, very happy to see everyone. All right, is ready? Get started, okay. All right, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and just start with some introductions and then talk a little bit about what our intentions are for today. Uh, my name is Jordan Shapiro. I'm an assistant director of college and academic advising with the Pinecrest School in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Pinecrest is a co-educational independent day school with two campuses, one in Boca Raton, which is pre-K through eight, and then a uh, pre-K through 12th grade in Fort Lauderdale, which is where I'm located. Um, I'm originally from Boston, Mass, um, but I grew up in Coral Springs, Florida. Uh, I'm a graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High and also the University of Central Florida. And after UCF, I moved back up to Boston uh, where I went to Suffolk University and earned a master's in school counseling and also a certificate in college admission counseling, which was part of my program there. Um, and then right after uh, Suffolk, I got a job with the University of Miami where I worked in their admission office for three years uh, before coming to Pinecrest in 2018. So I'll pass it over to Sarah to, to introduce herself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Barisic. I'm at St. John's Country Day School in Orange Park, Florida. So I am a college counselor here um, in Orange Park's right outside of Jacksonville for those of you who are unsure where that is geographically. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. I went to a small Levert college on the Eastern Tour of Maryland, Washington College, um, where I ended up serving as an admissions rep for a few years until taking the jump to the other side. And now I'm actually working towards getting my master's of social work through Florida State University. So I'm very excited to work with Jordan and to get to know all of you and also have David chat with us today. And really the purpose of today's session is to learn more about advocacy and how we can get involved, especially in these unprecedented times. And then also to work towards building a committee to get more involved and create a bit more of change, especially in our state right now. And with that being said, I would love to you know, shoot it over to David. All right, thank you, Jordan and Sarah, for for having me. I'll, I'll and and to the rest of you too for spending an hour with us this afternoon. Um, I'm David Hawkins, Executive Director for Educational Content and Policy with NACAC. Uh, I've been at NACAC. This is my 21st year. So if something's happened at NACAC in recent memory, then I've been witness to it. May have even had a role in it. Who knows? Uh, I was first hired as the Director of Government Relations, and, and as one tends to do after staying in, a, in the same job for 20 years, you tend to pick up other, other responsibilities along the way. So I do a lot more than that now, uh, but my, my first love and my, my passion is still around government relations, so I'm, I'm happy to be able to, to continue in that, in that vein. Um, and and I just, just to give you a sense of, of what I did uh, before I came to NACAC, I was uh, immediately before NACAC, I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development as a congressional affairs specialist in the Clinton administration, uh, which gave me an interesting insight into how the, the infrastructure of government works, you know, the, the, the agencies, the, the presidential or, or in, in a state uh, case, the gubernatorial administration, you know, it's, it, that, that executive function tends to be kind of similar. And then prior to that, I used to work at the Democratic Party up here in Washington as an opposition researcher, which it's, it, despite what you might have heard about opposition research, I wasn't rooting around in people's trash cans. It was a lot less um, romantic and, and glorious than that. I was in 
courthouses and land record offices and marriage certificate offices and you know roaming around the public records and, and the only reason I mentioned that is because believe it or not it has actually served me quite well at, at NACAC those, those skills that I picked up as, as an opposition researcher uh, it's it's quite it's quite amazing how interconnected all of our policy and, and politics are in this country and who's behind what and where certain things come from. So it's it's been really it's been really interesting for me to see at NACAC how that unfolds in our little neck of the woods. Um, but I thought um, what I might do before I share my screen to go through my PowerPoint, I have a couple of questions for you. But first, I want to establish my my SACAC and Florida bona fides because one of the um, first experiences I had at NACAC was, uh, you know, we work, we, we have worked with standing committees over the years, and the Government Relations Committee has been one of my committees for a long time. And my very first Government Relations Chair was Gordon Chavez from UCF. Um, and and he's, a, he's a wonderful person. I, I, I'm sure some of you, if not all of you know him, he's a terrific guy, and uh, I still keep in touch with him. Um, Zena Evans, who's at the University of Florida, used to work at NACAC. And she and I, you'll have to, if you ever see her, um, you'll have to ask her, you have to tell her her wonder twin said hi, um, which is an old 1970s superhero reference. So many of you won't get that. Uh, and then finally, the last time I was really engaged in, in, um, in Florida advocacy specifically was uh, with Deborah Landisberg. I don't know how many of you know her, but she had, she had sort of started or restarted some of the efforts in Florida for a while and, and has and really sort of, you know, I guess was was one of the early people at the at the state level within a within a region who really sort of started taking the state process um, as distinct from a more regional approach in a, in a regional NACAC affiliate. So a lot of great experiences with Florida and, and I look forward to to being a part of of, of all of your efforts to uh, to advocate. Um, so let me, before I throw up my PowerPoint, how many of you, and you, if, you, if you have your camera off, you don't have to turn it on. Um, I don't know if you're able to do your little uh, reactions down at the bottom of the page. Ah, mine keeps messing up. But if you want to do something you know, like that, when I say, um, when I ask the question, how many of you have, have done any sort of government relations type advocacy, whether it's meeting with a senator, congressman, state representative, mayor, uh, how many of you have done? Just just hit the hit the button if you if you've done any of that. Okay, got got a couple there. It's growing. Yep, yep. All right. How many of you have um, have gone to a principal or a president or a supervisor or a anybody and asked for anything? Like, if you can participate in a conference or if you can have uh, some supplies or a new program for your computer. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then how many of you have made a phone call on behalf of a student um, applying to college or, uh, or even, even just put in a good word for somebody uh, in, a, in a job process? I, I, think, I think we've got just about everybody. Yes. Okay. So everyone has done advocacy. I just want to make sure. I don't know what your various skill levels are or where you feel like you are. I think that's the more important thing. All of you have advocated and all of you are perfectly well equipped to do the kind of advocacy that that I do on a daily basis that uh, Jordan and Sarah are doing that you know that that we do just as part of our our process at NACAC and the main the main thing to remember is just you're the expert um, a lot of people when they get into politics and policy they feel like they have to be the expert on all on all matters education let's let's say in, in our example the fact of the matter is what you do on a daily basis makes you the expert the people up on Capitol Hill, they're responsible for the numbers and the, you know, knowing the ins and outs of federal processes and, and, and legislative rules and such. They need what they don't have up there, whether it's in Tallahassee or in Washington, is the knowledge of, of the way the world works. And I can say that because I've worked with an awful lot of Hill staff over the years. And I can test I can testify that there are very few who actually have a lot of practical experience in the world. So uh, a lot of them are quite young. In fact, we've had people come to our DC program. And got really nervous, you know, I could just see it for the, the folks are just so angst ridden about going up to the hill. And then a lot of times they'll come back and go, you're not going to believe this. The person I met with was a former student of mine <laughs> or something like that, you know, and then they still look like they're about 18. So, um, so there's a lot of ways in which we psych ourselves up about advocacy. But the truth of the matter is you're going to be the expert. Um, 
and 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 because, mainly because people want to know uh, how your experience is going to inform the policy equation. And in order to do that, they have to they have to just hear about the problems that you're facing. So let me see. I think yeah, I can share here. Let me go ahead and do that. And I, I will encourage you. Um, since since I'm on share screen, let me just do this. So we start at the real at the real beginning. Um, if you have any questions, I really want this to be a conversational thing. I, I don't envision, I have a lot of slides, but I'm not really gonna spend tons and tons of time on, on each slide. So at any point, if you have questions, please just go ahead and speak up, interrupt me. I'll pause every once in a while, but but feel free to do that. I can't see everybody's screen on this mode. So uh, so we'll go we'll go uh, with the, the blurting out of questions. <laughs> and like Jordan, I can see you, you're right below me probably because you're the host. So if you see somebody just sort of will start waving at me to, to be quiet. <laughs> we'll do, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. So this is just, I always like to do a little framing before I start into any sort of presentation. And this is just, these are just the three points around which I've organized the, um, uh, the presentation that I'm gonna walk through. First, what is policy advocacy? Second, how does NACAC set his priorities and what are they? And then third, how do I get involved? So we're gonna, that's gonna be the, the flow of the conversation. And I, I wanna, you know, again, I want questions to come along at any time and we'll, we'll certainly uh, make time to answer those when they come up or, or at the end, if you'd, if you'd prefer to wait. But um, we've already talked a little bit about what is advocacy. So now that you know all of you've done it, what remains is just to say, what, how does it apply in the policy context? And really, you know, the process by which they, I'll take the example of going to a principal or a president or, or a supervisor to say, you know, I really don't have enough people power or I don't have the program, the computer program I need to do this task. I don't have, uh, I, I'm running into a problem every time I try to do X. I need, I, I really could use something to help me out there. I need, I could use some professional development. I could use a new computer program. I could use some more, another person to help me get this job done. That's all policy advocacy is. It's the process of, of knowing that what you do every day, the problems you face are likely much wider and broader than, you know, if you're facing them, there's likely other people facing them too. So when you think about how much you have to do to just get to the students that you're trying to work with, when you see the students who can't afford college because they don't have the income and the need-based aid isn't enough, all of those things, that just basically aggregates up to be policy. And that's all in the world it is, whether you go to a city council meeting, a state legislative meeting, board of trustees, um, uh, state department of education, or, or a federal sort of legislative uh, forum. It's all about addressing challenges with collected resources. Uh, so in that light, I think it makes sense when you start talking about how am I gonna do this? I, I'm just a fill in the blank. You know, I'm just an executive director at an association. Well, I know what I know, right? And they don't, so I need to go and share that with them. Uh, so that's really, that's all policy advocacy is. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we set our priorities and, and what, what they are briefly just, and I think probably most of you will either know this already or you'll just recognize it because it's based on what you actually do in a day. The first thing I should mention is that uh, when people ask me, you know, like, how do you do advocacy at NAC? How do you determine what it is that you guys advocate for? My answer is always, I don't do anything unless the members tell me to. Uh, this job is not about me. This job is about you. And where that starts in the policy realm is with our core values. Uh, you all are familiar with the Guide to Ethical Practice in College Admission, which used to be called the Code of Ethics and Professional Practices, which used to be called the Statement of Principles of Good Practice. Uh, this is now um, the, 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 at least the title of the document that we go with. And these are the core values here on the left, education, access to equity, professionalism, collegiality, trust, and social responsibility. All of our policy priorities stem from those core values. That's, that's how we do this. Um, and you'll see how they how they play out um, as we go through this this presentation. The first thing that I wanted to to share with you is, as you can see, that this graphic shows you in September 2020, NACAC actually released kind of a new new angle to its policy advocacy, um, and this came directly out of our ad hoc committee for leadership in college admission. Um, they felt very strongly that NACAC had to, had to sort of elevate the story that we've been telling all these years about our our priorities for policy and for access that again are grounded in those core values. 
they felt like we had to really elevate those. And, and the bottom line was that they felt like, look, higher education is a public good. For the, for the last 40, 50 years, we've been treating it as a private good, you know, one that if you have the money, you can go and pay for it because it really only benefits you and you're, that's, that's how it goes. And, you know, that's, that's just how federal and state policies have shaped up over the last 50 years. Back when the Higher Education Act was passed in the, in the Lyndon Johnson administration, there was this sense that anyone should be able to go to public college, four-year college, for free. If they, if they can't otherwise afford it. That's more of a public good. That's where we said the Pell Grant is gonna cover the entire cost of a four-year public college. Um, and that's originally what it was intended to do. Fast forward to now, it covers less than a quarter of tuition, not, not, not the whole cost, but just tuition at a public four-year college. Meanwhile, student loans, stu uh, borrowing for college has grown 300% over the last 30 years. So you can see we've shifted that focus from, we believe that higher education had, creates a good, not just for the individual, but for society as a whole. And therefore we will fund it as a country. So I, I show you this report to just, to just sort of set the stage that even here very recently, we have, we have sort of recommitted ourselves to look, let's rethink everything. Let's, let's figure out, let's, let's realize that this higher education actually helps more than just each person that goes through it. It creates additional uh, income, which, which stimulates the economy, which provides more taxes, which helps the government, which also uh, the, the uh, higher education can help you feel more empowered, more engaged. You're more likely to be involved civically. There's just so many different ways in which higher education benefits the whole society. So we've decided to sort of set this as a foundation. And again, you can see that when you go back to the core values, a lot of these core values are directly in line with this message. So as we, as we then sort of proceed from there, so you're like, okay, that sounds like a good framework. So, but what, is, what does NACAC bring to that? Like, I guess you could be just about anybody and say that, right? But again, this is all informed by our experience. So, so how does this, what do we do in specific here? Well, to start off with, there, there's some challenges that we see in, in college access, and there's a lot of equity problems in there. First, there, I can't tell you how many reports I've seen that either talk about huge disparities in just straight up funding for public uh, elementary and secondary schools. Others go even further and they show the disparities in either students' ability to get to college preparatory curriculum because of the limitations they faced earlier on in school, or even if they are academically prepared to engage in things like AP or IB. A lot of times the public schools some of the public schools don't actually even have the AP courses that, that a lot of other schools do have access to. So there's multiple levels on which students can't get access to the college preparatory curriculum that we all know helps sort of move you through the college pipeline. There's also the problem with, with access to school counselors and college advising. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna duck down here to a map of, of Florida. Um, a couple of years ago, I'm sorry, last year we took data from a couple of years ago that was sent from the Department of Education in Florida to the federal government uh, that shows the student to counselor ratio by school district. And typically if your state has a lot of green in it, you're doing pretty well because the ratio there you can see on the right hand is, is you know, somewhere between 250 to one or 300 to one. So that's the number of students per counselor in public schools. Florida has got a lot of red. And it's interesting that the one green area, you notice where that is, right? State capital. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of interesting to me. But in any event, um, the idea here is to show that okay, we know in schools that we face a lot of challenges with serving the numbers of students that come our way. I mean, heck, some schools don't even have any counselors uh, to help students get get to college. Um, and this, of course, is symptomatic of the larger problem where we just have schools that are so chronically and 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 terribly underfunded. That, they, that there's so much more than this also that they don't have. But this is from our little neck of the woods, this is what we know. We know that we need more people to help students to, to actually get to college or any post-secondary education. I don't wanna suggest that it's just about four years because it's not, it's about two years. It's about uh, career and technical education, post high school, anything that you can do to better your, your prospects um, for a better life. So I'll go back here briefly and just round out this by saying, you know, you can do all the preparing in the world that you want to, but if they can't afford college, there's, you just sort of hit a wall. 
And so need-based financial fund, financial aid funding and, and state higher ed funding has got to be there. We have to fund our post-secondary institutions so that they are affordable. Um, the, it's interesting that um, Congress one time um, asked the question, and this is, a, this is a chronic question in DC, well, the more student financial aid we give out, the, the more colleges can just increase their costs. That's an argument you hear all the time. It's actually called the Bennett hypothesis after the former education secretary um, under the Reagan administration. But that has been proven false time and time again by research, including a report that Congress itself commissioned to ask why college prices were going up. And the number one reason college prices were going up is that state appropriations weren't keeping up with the demand. So as states draw down their funding, as they, as they reduce their funding per student, because you'll notice total funding tends to go up over time. It's the funding per student that starts to go down. And uh, that has effectively shifted the cost from the state over to people who are enrolled in college, so students and families. And that's why when you, when you increase loans, guess what happens to college prices? They tend to keep going up because the loans can expand way more than your income can. So there's, there's this whole funding system that we've set up between state, you know, states like Florida funding post-secondary education, the federal government not keeping up with their need-based aid and, and, and creating an over-reliance on loans that has just created this sort of toxic uh, acceleration towards higher prices and lower affordability. Uh, and then, and then, when you talk about walls and 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 obstacles to higher education, obviously you think about undocumented students, because even if they do graduate from high school, which many of them do, many of them are valedictorians, um, they get to college, and unlike some of their peers who are who do have documentation, they can't have access to state or federal aid in most cases. Definitely, definitely no federal aid. Some states have offered them uh, in-state tuition, but. Um, that's something NACAC has advocated for is, is to get undocumented students access to the same resources that, that other students have. So uh, the DREAM Act is something we've been pursuing in Washington for a long time, which would do precisely that. I'm gonna run through a couple more slides really quickly and then pause to see if there are any questions because this will just kind of round out. We'll go, we'll go through two more slides. Another part of our, our advocacy is sort of making good on the ethical side of the, of the core values uh, equation that, that we put forward. And that is protecting students from un, unscrupulous and predatory colleges. And, and most of the times when we, when we talk about this, we're talking about the for-profit colleges. So in, in contrast with the, with the process that we typically are involved in, in NACAC and SACAC, where students go to high school, they, they talk to their counselors, they are college advisors, they fill out their applications, they wait. Or maybe in the case of community colleges, they actually submit it there and, and, they're, and they're admitted right there on the spot. The for-profit sector is way different. They, they are they're very aggressive. They, they, um, they don't use the same model we do. And, the, and they just, they've just created a lot of problems. And, and, and the, um, part of what they do is they misrepresent themselves and they have this commission sales model where they, they, they pay their admission, admission, I use air quotes there, their salespeople based on the number of students they enroll. And that's just caused problems for the last, really the last almost a hundred years in federal policy. So NACAC has been very involved in advocating on behalf of students in these, in these situations and, and, and advocating for laws that really make it hard for for-profit colleges to go out there and do the kind of high pressure sales that you would expect from, I don't know, used car salesmen. I, I, hate, to, I hate to denigrate any single profession like this, but, but just things that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't do. And the main reason there is that when students walk up to an educational institution, there's a level of trust involved and we don't want to violate that trust. If I walk up to a, a vacuum cleaner salesman or a used car salesman or heck, even a new car salesman, I'm aware that, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to get, I'm going to probably need to negotiate here a little bit. I'm going to probably need to, to have my, my, my antenna up. Most students don't do that when they walk into an educational institution. And frankly, we think that's how it ought to be. I mean, they ought to be thinking about their interests, of course, and so should the institutions. That's, in fact, the core of our beliefs. But many of these institutions are not. So we've spent a lot of time on this. And you can see on the right of this slide here is, is the approach that many of the for-profits take is that they, they say it's all about covering, uncovering their pain and fears. Once they're reminded of how bad things are, this will create a sense of urgency to make this change. I can just imagine if someone from Central Florida, you know, taking that approach, how long they might last in the admission office. 
uh, probably not very long. And then finally, and I'll pause after this, we do we have recently added more global uh, priorities. And some of them are aimed at the US. You know, I think in the last four years, we've had a big problem with international students just not feeling welcome here in the US. And we just wanna make sure that we throw the doors open when it comes to education. We think students ought to be able to come here. We think our students ought to be able to go elsewhere. We should promote that. It, it creates understanding. It creates diplomatic goodwill. It's an, eco you, you wouldn't believe uh, the uh, Association of uh, Foreign Student Advisors uh, has calculated that, that um, international students bring about $40 billion to the US each year. And that's a lot of money. And the, and the folks that work at post-secondary institutions know that this, they have become a staple. They are really a, both a, an economic, but also a cultural underpinning to what we do. So NACAC has, has really sort of expanded its, its reach uh, to talk more about education in the global context. So that's a broad overview. Now, obviously, as we look at Florida, some of these things are coming come into play. Florida has the need-based aid program, the Bright Future Scholarships, right? Florida has a legislature that appropriates money for K-12 and higher education. Uh, Florida has not yet passed a DREAM Act. Uh, there's, you know, each state has a, has a system that resembles very closely the federal system in the way it provides money uh, for the processes that we just talked about. So everything that I do in Washington can also be done in, in, in Florida and in other states. So let me pause there for a second, see if you have any questions about our priorities or just want to discuss them at all. Jordan, I'll kind of look to you and Sarah. I can see you, Sarah. I'm just scrolling through to see if anybody has a hand up, but I yeah. don't know right now. Is there, I, I guess, you know, it was interesting when we, when we had um, some folks complete the survey, I, it was interesting to see the range of different issues and priorities that are on everyone's mind. Um, and, you know, clearly depending on your educational setting and, and who you're working with, um, you know, there are going to be issues that are more top of mind than others. Um, what, is there, are there, and I think, so, just to keep going on that, I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming to see, just to understand how the legislative process works in our state. Is there a good way that you recommend um, that people individually can, can focus on issues? Is it, do, you, do you recommend more of a macro approach, like a way of consuming, or do you, do, you, do you tend to recommend focusing on one or two issues and following those closely? Um, and how do you how do you best stay informed with so much going on and, and so much nuance in the, this process? Yeah, I, I'll say this: it is, I, I think, particularly when you're doing this on a volunteer basis, it's important to believe in what you're doing. So I would advocate for the more targeted approach. Um, certainly, if you're if you're you know Jordan or Sarah and you're looking at the whole effort, you're going to want to have one eye towards the big picture. But ultimately, you know, you have to do what you're interested in and what you have your what you where you feel your expertise is. So. Um, you know, one thing that 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 is is certainly helpful for me is that, and, and I'll show you this a little bit later in the presentation. Um, with in the digital age, you can plug into just about anything, and so the the question is just sort of where you're interested in in getting involved. Um, if you're interested in the whole legislature and the whole legislative process, each state legislature now has really cool. Um, web interfaces that you can go and, and, and find information about legislators and bills. And, and you can even sign up for updates on topics and on bills that are of interest to you. There's also nonprofit groups uh, that monitor state and federal legislation that you can sort of go and engage in. And I can, as a follow-up to this, Jordan, I know one of the things that I had said I was going to do ahead of time was to send you some resources. And I haven't done that in the presentation. But I can follow up with some some ideas about where to go for those. The other major uh, set of resources that I would mention is that depending on which issue you're involved in, there's a there's a there's a state level effort for just about every issue. And I'll in my last slide I think uh, our next to last slide has a, has some examples of some of the coalition partners that we have and and some of the coalition efforts that we belong to. And those would be really good places to go and just sort of start to hang out and look for issues. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're starting from the ground up, it can be intimidating. Heck, I go and do things on my personal time 
where I'm like, ah, oh, I'd love to be like a few years ago, I was really into the for-profit prisons, right? To, to why we have those and what their, what their effects are. And they're bad. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase. But I was amazed at how much was out there, like the American Friends Service Committee, which is the, you know, the, uh, the Quakers uh, sort of public policy arm wonderful resources on a whole range of progressive causes, uh, one of which happened to be for-profit prisons and others, uh, others of which include undocumented students and other, you know, so there's, and that's just one of, you know, dozens of organizations that are out there. So I hope that's not too like jumbled or confusing, but I'll send some, you know, given the issues that you cited, Jordan, and, and I'll talk about a couple of those a little bit later, I can share some resources about like how to find good information about these topics. That would be great. Thank you. Awesome. All right, uh, David, can yeah. I ask a question? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, yeah this is this is, uh, this is Ryan Riggs. I'm an Episcopal school in Jacksonville. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face down here in Florida is we have lots of people who are willing to advocate and who do advocate, but um, no one listens. <laughs> or if they listen, they just don't care. Uh, just the best example right now is with the the SAT or yeah. the ACT and that our state universities are still requiring them. And we've, we've written hundreds of emails to, to our board of governors and blah, blah, blah. I see Susan Groden on this call. Susan's been actively involved in that. There's so many good people pushing the board of governors and we've gotten nothing. I mean, they're, like, they're trying hard to ignore everything. It, it, it takes a lot for them to ignore us as hard as they are. So it, you know, how, how do you, how do you how do you help with that when 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 nothing seems to be happening? You know, that's Ryan. That's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up uh, because I'm right there with you. We we actually helped put that SACAC action alert together, and I've been heartened to see how many people have done it. You all have produced something on the order of four thousand messages out the door. So that means each person that you that 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 action alert went to got about. 400 messages in their inbox, which is to me, I, I just imagine myself sitting at a desk of someone who got 400 messages, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, Board of Governors, particularly speaking. Maybe um, they need 400,000. I don't know. I, you know, and, and here's the thing. I, I, before I, I'll say the sort of the bad news and then I'll get to the better news. The bad news is sometimes they don't listen. And that's, you know, 21 years of working at NACAC. I've had plenty of cases like that. The important thing to know is that along the way you're planting seeds. So whether you see the fruit right away or not, it, it sort of just is how fast growing is the plant, right? And in this case, we'd like it to be fast growing because we're trying to address a problem that's happening now. Um, and but I will say, and so so that so the bad news is that sometimes it doesn't pan out, and sometimes that defeat, that 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 loss or the inability can feel very frustrating and very um, sort of like. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it feels disheartening. Like you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but I'll tell you that, that that's advocacy. Advocacy is a roller coaster. And um, what makes those, those um, the fun parts so fun is when you've gone through the not so fun parts. So, so that's sort of a, an abstract, you know, touchy feely way to, to address that. What I'll say though, is that your messages are being heard in a way that is, for me, kind of interesting to watch. Just yesterday, I was on the phone with a reporter from Education Dive, which is a relatively new entrant to the online media uh, around higher education. And this reporter was just, he just was flabbergasted at how the board, and, and I've spoken with others, Eric Hoover at the Chronicle of Higher Ed, uh, Inside Higher Ed. Uh, we've talked to the papers down in Florida. I'll show a slide in a minute, the Miami Herald, Orlando, um, Tampa. They're all just sort of as mystified as we are. And so in a way, our efforts are making some noise. They're all aware of what we've been doing. And so I want you all to take that away that, um, that what you've been doing has actually been making a splash. It's just the people that we're trying to get to move are the ones not moving. And Susan, I'm, I mean, Susan, uh, uh, Ryan, I'm glad you mentioned Susan. I, I just wanna commend you, Susan. I, I have watched your social media and it's making a difference. I mean, you're you're hitting some real some real buttons out there. And it's and and when I talk a little bit later here about social media, I, I'm sure you'll you'll be able to say, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's it's been terrific. So let me let me go in here and Ryan. You know, again, you've asked a great question, and and I have, 
I, I'll give you an example. The DREAM Act has been that frustrating thing for me. Back in 2000 and I want to say 10, the U.S. House had passed the DREAM Act. Barack Obama had said he would sign it. And it had a majority of votes in the Senate. But the Senate majority leader insisted that the vote be a supermajority. And the DREAM Act fell short by about three votes of getting a supermajority. So it had a majority of the Senate. It had passed the House and the president was going to sign it. And it didn't go in. And it's still not passed in Washington. So for me, that has been terribly. And I ask myself all the time, what could I have done differently or better? And I just, sometimes it's just out of our hands. I mean, but it does drive us to continue and to, to just want it more, you know, to just keep going, or at least people like me who might be a little crazy. But um, in any event, uh, let me just talk a little, a little bit about, and I'm going to keep an eye on the time here, um, a little bit about, you know, advocacy and how to get involved. Uh, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago, a Zoom call, and Senator Durbin from Illinois was on there as a guest speaker. And he relayed this story to us. He said, you know, one of my old mentors said the six most important words in any advocacy pitch are, let me tell you a story. And that goes back to what I said at the beginning. It's got to be about what you're facing every day. I think some of us, myself included, tend to lean towards the data angle because I think data tends to be pretty convincing. But when you when you talk about the legislative process, data data will convince some people, but everybody has to pay attention to the stories, especially if you bring people in who are actual stakeholders. So if you're a constituent, then you're a stakeholder. If you have students or families that are being hurt, those are also stakeholders and they're voters and constituents too. So you're, that this storytelling element of advocacy is so critical and, and, and it will win the day. So I'm gonna offer a few tips and I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, you know, how to even get started in all of this. If you're wanting to approach any sort of policy maker, any, any way to do this, the introduction can be your best sort of point of entry. And introductions don't have to be bland. Uh, I, I got a picture down here in the bottom left of the screen of, of the late Senator George Voinovich from Ohio. One of my very first legislative conferences that I ran at NACAC, we, we had the, the fly-in, we had people come in from all over the country, some NACAC members from Ohio went to his office, and it turns out that his legislative director had gone to a high school where one of our counselors worked, and his school counselor, who he was very fond of, had passed away recently. And he was very upset by that. He hadn't known about it. This legislative director said, I will champion your priority that you, know, that you want in this bill uh, from the education, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And it was that personal connection, that tiny little connection of that he went to this school and his counselor had passed away and he felt like he wanted to do something for her that ultimately enabled us through Senator Voinovich's office to get a provision providing professional development eligibility for school counselors into the No Child Left Behind Act. Not our favorite bill, but that provision was a win for us. And it happened because one of our members simply introduced themselves and said, hi, I'm from this high school. <laughs> and that to me is, that, that's just the epitome of good, of, uh, of, of, of just a feel good story. But in any event, um, you know, one thing that you can do also to sort of get, get to know legislators is to offer to, to be helpful to their constituents. Uh, we've had we've had members come to town and, and offer to do financial aid and college admission nights for members of Congress, and they'll take you up on it. And state legislators too. Um, they always need that kind of information. Uh, I've listed a service academy night here just to give you an example of that. Congress people do this stuff regularly, and you know we don't want them talking to our students about college admission, do we? No, we want us to talk, talk to them. So, you know, in the process of introducing yourselves, you can always. Um, Offer to be of help if you feel so inclined. The last thing is, of course, then how can I help your inform your policy needs? And I've got a picture here of Jane Fonash, who was our, um, is she the immediate? Yeah, she's the immediate past president. I'm sorry, I get kind of twirled around in these, in these COVID inspired days. This is her testifying in front of the Senate a couple of years ago, um, the Senate Finance Committee. And, and she was there to talk about tax breaks for higher education. Now, is or am I an expert in tax breaks for higher education? Absolutely not. Is Jane? No. Why was she there? Because she was a counselor. And what the committee wanted to know is, do you all know about these tax breaks? And she basically said, no, we don't. We don't get information from the IRS. Nobody pays attention to us school counselors. And the committee, you should have seen the committee's reaction. They're like, what do you mean you don't know about these things? Jane was like, I mean, I don't know about these things. <laughs> like, 
we don't get information from the IRS to school counselors. Like that's a, and that's a big deal because we're talking to students and families all the time. So just by virtue of being who you are, you can find yourself right in the middle of a committee hearing at some point. And it's all just about introducing yourself, offering to be of help, sharing what you know about what you do and being able to answer questions from that perspective. Um, here's a, another good example of how uh, our work in the, in the US Senate has, has paid off. This is, this is a letter that uh, Senator Durbin sends every year to educators throughout Illinois. And, and it basically says, be careful about for-profit colleges. It's an issue which he's passionate about. We've worked with him for more than a decade on this thing. And the little story behind this, you know, this is all nice and pretty on his letterhead and it goes out and you see in the red box, you see the organizations that it went to, you see us included in there. The little secret is that we wrote this, the, this letter. We wrote it 10 years ago and he's just used it every year since then. Now he's got his quotes in there and, and has tweaked it. But the letter he sends out to the schools was written by NACAC. And it's, it's that kind of thing that at some point they come to trust you as a resource. And you might even find yourself on the receiving end of a question of, can you write this for me? You know, if, if, you were to, if you were to say something to students or schools or whoever they want to speak to, how would you phrase it? And that all stems from just introducing yourself. So that's the first thing. The second bit that I'll mention here is, the, is sort of how you, do, how you do meetings. Once you've gotten through the introduction, how do you get, get involved in, in sort of the interchange with, with uh, policymakers? I just listed out a few bullets here. Calls and emails. We just talked about this. Ryan's question was aimed directly at this. What do, do they matter when you call your representative, when you email a board of governors? What they're concerned with, you know, your individual email may not be read by the member or your call might not be relayed to the member, but what will be relayed is how many of them came in. And that's, that, that's true to this day. Even with, even with emails, as, as many as they get, they will tally them up. And if there are 400 emails coming in about the SAT and ACT in Florida, they have to deal with it at some level. We may never see it. Um, it may cause all sorts of internal grief and they may be eating a lot of Tums or whatever, which we hope they are. Um, but that's, um, that's the way those things will work. Uh, the virtual or in-person visits, again, that's where the storytelling comes in when they have to see people, when it, you know, part of the benefit of going and actually meeting with someone, particularly when there's a pressing challenge or when there's something you, when there's an opportunity. A lot of legislators will get a little frustrated if you go in and just sort of don't really have anything to ask for, or just, you know, you're just, if it's not, a, if, if it's not the first time you've been there, you're just introducing yourself. Typically you wanna go in and have a purpose, have a, you know, have a, an agenda, have a story to tell. Um, and even if you don't have a way to fix it, you at least can go in there and say, you need to know this is a problem. And I may not have the solution, but I'm here to tell you it's a problem. And I'm willing to work with you. <laughs> I'll put my brain to work, but you know, you're the one that has to, you're the elected official, you have to figure this out as well. Um, and, then, and then along the lines of the introduction, sometimes um, inviting them to speak, inviting them to come visit your campus or your school. Uh, we've had so many people uh, host uh, legislators, whether they're state or federal at their school, so they can just see, they don't have any idea what we do. Really good example, I was speaking to a panel of state legislators one time in, in, um, out in St. Louis, uh, and these were legislators from all over the country. And I started talking about how the challenges with college advising are a lot like the challenges with, with the FAFSA from the financial aid perspective. We, Congress started by asking, what do we do about college affordability? And they, they started sort of plinkoing down to, to various issues. And then they realized, wow, the FAFSA is really hard to fill out. And so this major bipartisan consensus emerged around simplifying the FAFSA. Well, the same thing seems to be happening on the college access front where they're saying, what do we do about college access? And they sort of plinko down there like, well, we have to have people to help students make the transition. And I sort of like, that's us. Well, I had just gotten through that, you know, probably it probably took me about three minutes to say what I just said in 30 seconds. And this chairperson of a state education committee, a Senate, state Senate education committee raised her hand and said, what's the FAFSA? <laughs> and my head just was like, if I could have done this, I would just like hit, hit my head on the desk because I was like, oh, I have to start all over again. So the, the idea that, that we have to sort of teach them about what it is we do is really central to that. And some legislators will know, but others, the vast majority probably won't. So to my earlier point, if you do go and meet with somebody, these are some, some just basic 
basic uh, tips for, for making it a successful meeting. Uh, being prompt, concise, their time is really stretched. Um, they typically only have 15 minutes at the most to meet with any single constituent or any, any single group. Um, have a game plan, you know, know what you want to ask for, know what you want to say. Oftentimes when folks come to Washington, we give them time to sort of plan out. Like maybe there's four people going to visit a, a Florida senator. Say, okay, well, I'll, I'll say this, you say that, you talk about DREAM Act, I'll talk about counseling. You know, and we'll we'll hit those points, and then we'll get we'll get to the ask. Um, uh, being prepared for anything, you know, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you walk in there, and you're expecting to meet with the the legislator, and, and out comes a, someone who looks you know who looks like they just got their driver's license, um, and that can throw you off sometimes. Um, but I'll tell you, one time I went in to to a visit with some folks from New York State, uh, and and we were on Capitol Hill, and we we met with a staff person. And she looked as disinterested as anybody I've ever seen in my 21 years on Capitol Hill. And I was so discouraged. And everybody in the group was so discouraged, yet we did our thing. We followed all these tips. And about a week later, I got an email from this staffer. And she said, we'd like to sponsor your bill. And I was, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was like, are you kidding me? You look like you were half asleep during that meeting. And it turned out she, uh, she, we ended up following her through her career. She ended up going and work, working for Senator Durbin, which was another reason why we were so close with his office. Anyway, you just never know what's gonna happen. And then the follow-up can be helpful too, uh, making sure you follow up and you say, hey, it was nice to meet with you. I wanna reiterate that I wanna be helpful to you. And then, you know, you can certainly bug them to death uh, by email. That's, that's, certainly, that's certainly allowed. Um, so those are just some some ways in which uh, which this you know this thing could work out and and the reason that I that I put this slide up was that that visit that New York visit I mentioned that was Timothy Bishop and you can see Mr Bishop right there in that little red rectangle towards the top of the the first page there this is the bill that he introduced and guess who wrote it NACAC did and the benefits of writing a bill mean that you also get your name in it sometimes so that's why I underline that up there so that's you know, again, this, if you had told me that this congressman was going to introduce this bill that we wrote at the time I had that meeting with his staff, I would have bet my life savings against it. And I'd have been totally broke at this point. So anyway, be prepared for anything. Uh, the last thing I'll mention, and this is then I hope we have a few minutes. Let me see. Let me just run through this. Yeah, okay. We got a few slides left, but social media. Uh, and this is probably not a surprise to any of you. Um, you know, direct, you can, you can tag anyone you want who has a Twitter account, of course. And that's, that's kind of effective because at the state legislative level, it's possible that the legislator him or herself might see it. At the federal level, at the very least, their communications team is going to see it. Um, collective advocacy, we've done social media storms, you know, if you partner with other groups or just do a, a SAC Act day um, where you just, at, at a given time, you decide to go out and flood social media with all sorts of posts about something. Um, and then again, you've got the storytelling where you're actually, you know, again, in, in little bits, maybe not like a visit, but in little bits, you're telling people what reality is. You're saying, hey, this is a problem. You know, here's a news article. Here's a picture of my students. Here's a story. This is real. This is hurting right now. This is something we have to fix. So these are the ways in which we engage. And I've, I've put up a few examples here of, of, for instance, on the top left there, the direct contact where I've tagged two members of Congress to thank them for uh, submitting a resolution just a couple of months or just last month about National College Application Month. Um, you can see that sometimes our tweets uh, on the right here get fed into a, a coalition uh, web page, and you can see that my the NACAC wonk tweets there are are um, posted for everybody to see on this web page that we don't own, but that someone has has said we want their feed uh, on our on our page. Um, the Committee for Education Funding tweet down here is a good example of the of the the storm. Uh, this is a coalition we belong to in D.C., and every once in a while they'll do a, an education funding storm on on social media, and it really does flood offices. You can see that this this particular tweet tags a few California legislators, including our vice president elect. Um, and these are these are ways in which we can we can really get. Um, get more attention than we ever could before, before the digital age. The one on the bottom left there is, is something I always like to see. And, and that is when I put something out on the NACAC wonk that I have members that are retweeting it. And that amplifies our message because I can tweet it. I have about 5,000 or so followers and that's great. 
but when others start to pick it up, then that amplifies it uh, exponentially. And so that's the kind of thing when you're looking to get involved. You know, Jordan, to your question earlier, a lot of times one of the first things you can do is find these other organizations' Twitter feeds and follow them and start retweeting their stuff or even adding to it. Uh, so that's that's one of those um, you know that's one of those new facets to um, uh, to advocacy that I haven't had access to before. And then the last thing I'll talk about is, is is earned media, which is a little different from social media. This is your letters to the editor, uh, Ryan. I think this might get to some of your question about you know how do we make a difference if all of our emails to the board are not going anywhere, our social media, they're not apparently not listening to that either. You know, these different ways here, um, submitting op-eds, tagging reporters, you know, blogs and, and things like that are ways that, that you can sort of work around the process and start to build momentum outside of your target audience. You know, for instance, here's, a, here's an op-ed that just ran last week, in fact, or two weeks ago um, in the Orlando Sentinel. This is a math teacher from in Florida and she's advocating for the DREAM Act. I thought, okay, awesome. Like a math teacher, you just, you know, it, wouldn't have thought that that would be her role to advocate for, but she sees the students, she understands the issues, bam, there you go. And it's right in the Orlando Sentinel. Sentinel. And then that can be amplified, that can be put out on social media, that can be sent to your representatives. Hey, she wrote this thing, I'm there too. I see the exact same thing in schools and this is something I'm passionate about. This is a good example of tagging reporters. This is a tweet that we sent out um, back in October about our joint letter, SACAC, NACAC and ACCEPT. Uh, to try to convince the Board of Governors to change their policy on SAT and ACT. I've tagged here this SM Travis is a writer for the Miami Herald. He sent the, he, he, he notified these folks who were responsible for this story. And, a, and, a, and just what, about a week later, you know, there's a story in the news. And I'm not saying, suggesting that they weren't gonna write that already, but the difference was that our letter got cited in that story. And so that's additional exposure. That's, hey, that, that's, these are the people who know this stuff, counselors and admission officers, and look what they're saying. Um, and then finally, this, this, this idea of allied organizations. If you name an issue, I will tell you the coalition we belong to to address that issue, because truly there are no issues that, are, that you ever really have to work on alone. Um, and so as, again, Jordan, as, you, as, you sort of, as we think about issues that we care about, there's always a coalition to get involved in. There's always other organizations on the watch. Sometimes we're the lead on the, on the issue, sometimes we're not. So, so it'll just depend. And, and a good example on, in Florida is this SAT, ACT issue. We are the lead on this one. People are looking to NACAC, SACAC, Accept Group to, to sort of set the pace. So, so I realize I kind of rushed through that information. We only have about five minutes left, um, but I wanted to offer at least a few minutes here for questions and comments. I realize I sort of hit the brakes really hard there. <laughs> Any takers? No. Um, David, I just want to thank you. I, I really appreciate your time um, and and your information and your wisdom on all of this. Um, I I am really excited. Uh, Sarah and I, I should have said this at the beginning, but Sarah and I have been talking about uh, ways to, to kind of corral uh, educators in our state so that we can be better advocates. And, and, um, and when everything, the world started to change over the summer, we were talking about how we can take advantage of this virtual space. And that we really wanna um, progress towards um, having speakers and uh, who have this sort of experience and, and to get this kicked off with you was just really wonderful. Um, so we really appreciate your time. Um, I think going forward, we, we'd love to establish um, a committee of some sorts to, to try to really come together and discuss these issues and, 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 and better advocate for our kids and our profession. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel really energized after this and excited. Um, so we'll absolutely be in touch. A, a goal of ours uh, long-term is to, to eventually have uh, a legislative day similar to what a number of states have done um, and go to Tallahassee and, and talk to legislators. And, and um, But I, I definitely think that starting off with just some conversations um, is a great way to do that. And this was certainly, uh, certainly welcome. So thank you.
Oh, that hey, listen, and and I want to reiterate to all of you that that this is this is what I'm here for uh, to to help and support you. And as you can probably tell from the presentation and the pace that I went through it, there's this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, so it, you know whether it's for the the group as as a whole or whether it's individual. If you have questions, I really encourage you to reach out. I'm happy to follow up. Happy Jordan, I will follow up with more resources, and we'll we'll just you know we're here to support your efforts. Great, thanks. Thank you so much, David. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, David, put his email and you can reach out to Jordan or myself, especially in the future in building a committee. But we appreciate you, David, and all of you for taking the time. I think Susan said it best. It's a lot to digest, but once we digest that, we can make an action plan and we'll get something going. All right, well, thank you all. Have a great day, thank you. Thanks everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you. That was great. Great yeah. job, guys. Awesome. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm yeah. excited to see what happens next. I thought that went really well. He's awesome. Yeah, he's an incredible speaker. Even virtually. You know, and also, I mean, no matter how many times you hear it, it's always good to like hear some of this stuff again. There's always yeah. new information. And... I agree. There's a lot actually that I didn't even think about or wouldn't have thought of, I guess you could say, in terms of getting more involved and even the op-ed idea, writing to a, a newspaper. Like I keep forgetting that, you know, that would be helpful, right? Like instead of just using social media, you can use it, but through an actual newspaper, that sort of thing, so. I definitely have to get more involved in social media. Like I have. Me too. I don't, I, I try not to. The same way. It's clearly like such a great way to, to do this type of work. And I think, um, especially in our profession to stay connected, I think it's a really good way to, to just be in touch with everyone and stay in the loop. So um, I'm, I'm happy with how that went and long time in the making. So I'm glad that we were able to do it. Uh, so maybe, I know that we have a meeting set up for the 14th and then we can start talking about what we want to do next. Yeah. Yeah. You know, enjoy your holidays. Nice job. Great way to knock all this out before Christmas. This is so amazing. Um, I hope y'all, you know, have a wonderful break and, and get a break and are able to kind of disconnect from everything. Um, maybe turn off the emails a little bit. And we yeah, can, yeah, I, definitely I, hope, and I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting the away message on. Yeah. <laughs> it's on me at that point if I want to check. And I I have control issues with that. So I check my email way too often. So me it's, too. Uh, but I, I'll definitely take a break. <laughs> well, awesome job, guys. That was so great. Um, yeah. Thank you for all of your work on it. Um, and have a Merry Christmas. Thanks. You too. Thank you so much for your help too. Yes. Oh, Seriously. my pleasure. I don't think I did very much, but you know, oh, you did. I'm, no, you, you did. did. I'm yeah. really happy to have such great chairs in Florida. Appreciate that. Yes. Um, and y'all should feel good about this. This is the first event, like legislative event we've had in Florida in years. That's exciting. That is exciting. It is exciting. I'm excited about it. So, you know, congratulations and thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, y'all. Have a good holiday, Bye. guys. Thanks so you much. You too. Bye.